Good morning. Oh, is this on? Good morning, everyone. I hope we're having a wonderful Wednesday morning. Would everyone please stand with us as we worship together?
people's hearts today and um, as we went on our day, Lord, we would just be meditating on your word and your presence, Lord. So just pray that you bless the rest of this chapel and thank you, Lord, for this day. Amen. Thank you all. Let me stop this. Hope you guys are having a great day. I'm excited for today. Um, our speaker today comes all the way from Kansas City. Um, she's been, she was a youth pastor for, for several years, I think seven years here in town. Um, she's a student at Fuller, Fuller Theological, Theological Seminary. Um, And she has a heart seeing people know how deeply they're loved by Jesus. Sarah Jo has a, a communications degree um, and a master's in public administration. And she just loves school so much that she decided to go back to school again for another degree. She lives in a suburb of Kansas City with her husband Lee and their children Lydia, Penelope, and Hezekiah. Uh, Sarah Jo uh, is one of my favorite friends, but also speakers. I love to listen to her, and I know that she's got a word from the Lord for you today. So, Sarah Jo, would you come up, and I'll just pray for you and for our time here today. All right. Jesus, I just thank you, thank you, thank you for Sarah Jo. I thank you for bringing her here. I pray that you would just speak through her today. I pray that her words would be your words. Her tru the truth that she speaks would be your truth that would change and penetrate our hearts to transform us, to help us to know how much you love us, to challenge us, to encourage us, and to, um, and to motivate us to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hi, guys. Hello. Good morning. It's good to be here. I was so excited to be here. I couldn't even sleep this morning, so I ended up leaving my house by like 640 uh, to get here. Uh, so I'm very, very thrilled to be here with you. Even though the years keep passing that I'm away from Tabor longer and longer, it still feels a little bit like Tabor's always going to be a little bit of home. Um, Lee says hello. Where's Marvin? Is Marvin in here? No? Hey! We have to take a selfie together afterwards to prove that I talked to you. I think I saw you out in the lobby, but I got a little shy. So um, afterwards, I know shy, and here I am up front putting you Front and center here, but Lee says hello. Lee says hello to so many of you. Uh, I, I love your guys' theme. Uh, it's kind of dark times right now uh, in the world in so many ways, but there's also so much hope, and God is still at work, and God is moving. Uh, but I love the imagery of God as light in the darkness uh, because uh, I've had a very privileged life, a very good life, but I've also faced some really, really dark times. And there have been seasons where I cringe when people talk about the faithfulness of God because I just didn't feel like God had been faithful to me or times when things were dark. But I look back and I realize that so much of those dark journeys, I'm just, even when I can't see the light, like, I just trust that it's there and I'm like groping around in the dark like the way you do for a light switch. And God is just meeting us there over and over again, even when we're in that place where like, I don't want to hear about his faithfulness. He's so faithful that he's faithful to us even when we are unfaithful. Praise God. Praise God, right? Um, I want to look at two passages with you today. I don't, I don't normally do that. I really, really like to, to sink in and, and dissect one passage. I love that. Um, but we can't be here all day. And uh, I, I just really feel like um, uh, there, that God has a word for us today, for, for me too, um, in, in light of, of just the things going on in the world, but also just the reality of being human. Uh, and the first passage is in 1 Corinthians 1, and the second is in Matthew 5. Isn't God good? I actually didn't know what your theme was. Look at that. Okay, Lord, you're good. Um, so uh, as we look at that, I want to, us to consider, like, right, like we read Scripture, we study Scripture, um, and we try to make these parallels into our lives today. Like, how, like what does Scripture actually teach me about who God is, the character of God, and how I actually follow Jesus today. And uh, it's tricky sometimes because there's not always these like really specific practical examples. Like not every life scenario that we face today is just outlined in scripture and tells us how to do what, whatever, right? It's not that simple. We have to uh, discern in the word and in the faith community and with the Holy Spirit what it means in each given situation, given the various uh, differences and dynamics and variables in our lives, how to follow Jesus and shine the light of the Lord in the world around us. 
that's tricky because there's so many differences between the way the world worked uh, when the Bible was written and in the history that it talks about and the way the world is today. But there are also so many similarities. There are so many parallels that are easy to make. And as I describe a little bit, just briefly, we're just going to kind of skim on the surface. And, and my hope actually is not that I'll give you answers today, but that I'll leave you with more questions. And the reason that I am such an advocate of more questions is a few, a few reasons. One, I don't know everything. Two, even the stuff I think I know, I could be wrong about. And three, I am convinced that questions, as many questions as you can think of about God's word, leads to greater intimacy with God. So ask all the questions you have the tough ones. And if you're reading scripture with no questions, then I don't think you're really reading it because there's some confusing whack stuff in there, right? A woman gets chopped up in the Old Testament. It's weird. It's violent, right? There's stuff to unpack. So we don't have to pretend like the Bible doesn't leave us with lots of questions. But the Lord sent us the Holy Spirit to help us discern and to process, and we may get it wrong sometimes, and we may get it right. So, The Corinthians, uh, a a group of believers who had trusted in the way of this man, Jesus, who had walked the earth, um, Paul's writing to them about their faith journey. But what we need to know about them is that in Corinth, okay, so they're, they're relatively new Christians, right? But the tradition and the culture of where they lived, um, had a very big emphasis on social status. We have no idea what that's like, do we? The Corinthians were keenly aware of social status. They knew other people's social status. They knew their own social status. Uh, and self-promotion was, was kind of the expected way of life. You should work on self-promotion. You should work towards that. And the measures for gaining higher social status were wisdom, so like education and knowledge, power, and money. Okay? And either you gained these for yourself or you kind of attached yourself to someone who did. You kind of associated yourself with someone who did. Now, it's not surprising that these distorted, broken, unreliable values of uh, knowledge, power, money um, created problems, right? It created problems among the Corinthian believers, and they were having a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, A lot of times when we read 1 Corinthians 10, because verse 10, and you'll see in a little bit, is considered kind of the thesis statement for Corinthians, we think that 1 Corinthians is just about divisions. Uh, But as I've studied it, um, I... I'm finding that the, div- the divisions are a result of the problem. They're a symptom of the problem. And the problem was this identity crisis that uh, so many Corinthian believers were having. And the identity crises came because they had this way of seeing the world and living. Uh, and then this man, Jesus, showed up on the scene. And he, like, challenged everything. And they're like, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to trust in Jesus. And I'm going to follow his way. And so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab a hold of what he tells me is this abundant life that he has for me but I'm not quite ready to let go of the way I used to see the world and the way I measured my value and worth. So Jesus is saying that through the cross, you know, I have this, this, I have am clothed in his righteousness, but I still want to get for myself wisdom, power, money, right? So they're like, who am I and who am I going to be? So does that, does that identity crisis kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they were conflicted by that because they had to figure out, how they were going to follow Jesus who, who came, stirred the pot, challenged the status quo, died and rose again, right? Now, the opening of Paul's message to them, um, we're starting in verse 10. I'm just going to read that for you guys here. It says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, Corinthian believers were measuring their value and rightness, their place, according to which earthly leader that they belonged to. They were sort of pledging their allegiance to these various leaders, sort of in the hopes that um, the the better qualities of those leaders, the the pride and what those leaders knew, their wisdom, their knowledge, right, their power, would sort of of be bestowed on them by association. Uh, One way I kind of think about it is like, when you're a big fan of a team and your team wins something really big, like the World Series or the Super Bowl or whatever, you don't say, oh, yeah, they won. You say, we won, 
right? So it's a little bit like that. Now, um, this was extremely divisive because it wasn't like, okay, yeah, I belong to Paul and you belong to Apollos. Cool, cool, we can be friends. No, it was competitive. Who was right? And it's a little confusing because they throw in this, I belong to Christ, right? You're like, well, isn't, aren't those the right ones, right? Sunday school answer, aren't they? Uh, and if you, you can spend a lot of time unpacking that, but it's possible that that was more of uh, this like prideful thing, like we're the right ones because we actually belong to Jesus, right? But the attitude of their hearts wasn't in, weren't in line with Jesus. Uh, it reminds me of so many events in church history and modern day when people wave the banner of the name of Jesus over really violent acts or persecution, right? We can look across church history. They were waving the banner of Jesus Christ or the banner of the Lord, and it was not at all honoring to the Lord, right? Okay, so it's possible to say that but not actually be living in and belonging to Christ, okay? Now, Paul's cure for this identity crisis is rooted in the confusing and mind-boggling symbol of the cross. Verse 18, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. That's a mouthful, huh? For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Why does Paul bring up the cross? And your go-to my, my answer might be, because the cross is how we're saved from our sins. But that's not the only reason he brings it up. In fact, that isn't really the reason he brings it up. The reason he brings up the cross is because the cross was such a controversial way for Jesus to bring redemption to the world. It was countercultural. It was more than countercultural. It is offensive, violent, and confusing. That's what the, the cross symbolizes in Corinthian culture. And yet from this culturally violent symbol, Paul launches his appeal to them. Remember the cross. Because the cross tells us something about the mind of Christ. And you heard it read earlier that he appeals to them to like be in agreement. And that scripture has been misused so many times to manipulate people into this just terrible group think. Like we all just need to think the same, be the same, have the same opinions. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Guess what? That's not true because once again, sometimes we get it wrong. The diversity of the body of Christ is what makes it so beautiful. It's what makes it so full and whole and abundant. So we're going to have different ways of viewing the world. We're going to have different opinions and we're going to have different backgrounds. Thank God for that. We are not always going to see things exactly the same way. Yet, Paul says, be like-minded, be united in the mind of Christ. And later in uh, 1 Corinthians, he'll say that believers actually have the mind of Christ. We actually receive the mind of Christ as we grow in intimacy with the Lord and as children of God. So, he brings up the cross because it doesn't make any sense that Jesus would conquer death by surrendering to it, right? Because a conquering king that comes will do what? conquer, right? That's what they expected. That's what people expected from kings. They expected kings to be dominant and powerful and have tons of wealth and tons of wisdom and just lord over everybody. And that's not what Jesus did when God incarnate came into the flesh. And it's not what he did in how he was born or how he was raised or where he came from, how he lived or how he died. Jesus did things completely differently than what people expected in culture. So his death and resurrection are the pulse of Paul's message because it embodies this radical countercultural uh, reality of who Jesus was and what the mind of Christ was. And so his vision for what Christian life in faith community should look like is rooted in and shaped by this bizarre symbol of the cross. It's normalized to us, right? The cross, Jesus, yay, we wear it on necklaces and stuff, but that is not what it would have been like for them. It, it, was, it was like if Jesus 
had died by lethal injection today or uh, an electric chair or some kind of violent death sentence, right? Like we, have to, we have to try to appropriate to a certain degree and make sense of it, of what it would look like in our culture today so that we can understand the significance of it thousands of years ago. It was a very controversial symbol. And Paul wants believers to remember the mind of Christ, Jesus is the one who suffered and died a criminal's death even though he was innocent. So it's not surprising that the gospel message fell on many ears as total foolishness because that sounds crazy. Jesus didn't fight for himself. He didn't demand his innocence. Uh, he, he, he didn't even put up a physical fight. He surrendered to it by choice because he had all the power he needed to fight against it and he still chose. He still chose that path. So in a culture obsessed with social status, it's a miracle. It, I mean, it is a miracle that any of them were willing to associate themselves with someone who had been crucified. It, it just, you just would not do that. So then Paul goes on and implores them. Beginning in verse 27, he says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. There's two of the things that they've measured their value on. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is risen, written, and he's quoting Jeremiah 9 here, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. The CEB translates verse 28 like this. God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. It's a whole different world order when Jesus is on the throne. It is a completely different world order. And the, the Corinthians have to decide then who is their king. Is it Jesus? Because the ways of Jesus, as Paul identifies with the cross, are foolishness to the world. So let me ask you this. When was the last time that your Christian beliefs or uh, your embodiment of following Jesus got you called a fool? And when was the last time that those things that you believe about Jesus, the things that you follow Jesus, that don't have to do with drinking or sex, got you called a fool? Because th there's like these like three headliners for Christians that, that, that like were like, I'm persecuted because I'm pro-life and because I don't think you should have sex before your marriage and because you shouldn't drink. Like, oh, woe is me. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm not criticizing anyone. But like these are like our, right, these are our things. We're like, that's what I'm going to be persecuted for. And we just disregard all of these other, other teachings that, that, that stirred up so much uh, of a ruckus that Jesus did and spoke. And this is where I want to transition just a little bit from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. The reality is, is that we're not that different than the believers in Corinth. Right? It's not difficult for us to come up with examples of labels or leaders that we've attached ourselves to. Right? It's such, the, the examples are so controversial, I don't even want to name them because I know the kind of emotion that they stir up. Right? I could get half of the room polarized from me or disregard anything that I have to say by announcing who I voted for or whether or not I'm vac vaccinated, right? And it's not just the world. It is just spicy hot among believers too, isn't it? Right? So <clears throat> we are not that different than them. We're not. And in fact, these, these things, these leaders, these groups – have become so important to us that we have pledged our allegiance to them in a way that is so extreme that it's not like we would just die for these things. I won't just die for my beliefs. I will viciously slaughter for them. And that doesn't always mean physically kill, though we see plenty of evidence of that, right? We see plenty of acts of violence because, against people who disagree, that they disagreed with, right? attacking groups, organizations, whatever, just because they hold a worldview or have a belief system that feels threatening to someone else. 
And while we may all not go out and commit acts of violence, we have all used malicious words that drip with venom with the way we speak about and to people who disagree with us. I'm just as guilty as most of you. Most of you, because not all of you, because I'm sure some of you are worse than me. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> right? We, we all, we do it. I mean, just go skim the comment section of anything on social media, right? Think about this. Just consider for a moment some of the ways that you have heard some human beings talk about or to other human beings, all made in the image of God. Think about the way you have heard some Christians talk about other people, human beings made in the image of God. Think about that. Is it shining the light? Because I don't think so. And I'm pretty sure I'm right about that one. Right? It doesn't reflect anything of Jesus. We are not that different from the Corinthians. We are also trying to decide who our king is. And there are some other people in the running besides Jesus. There are some other ideologies in there besides the way of Jesus. We like to pretend that they're not, but they're there. Right? And we try to blanket them under the umbrella of Jesus. Like, well, I'm committed to this because it's underneath the way of Jesus. Right? I'm choosing this earthly king because this earthly king best represents my heavenly king. Right? And that's not what we're called to. We're called to have one king. I'm not saying you shouldn't participate in politics. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek justice. Scripture specifically tells us to seek justice. Somehow we can seek justice without using our words to tear down. We are called to seek justice and, and called to speak wholesome talk out of our mouths and to have our hearts filled with love for one another. So somehow that has to be possible. So what is Paul calling us to? What is Paul calling people, believers to today as he was the Corinthians? And it's not just that we all have, have the same opinion. What are we supposed to do with the wisdom of God, right, which is foolishness in the world? What are we supposed to do with that? And like I said, the example of God's wisdom is manifest boldly in the cross because the cross was so controversial and so confusing a way for a king to come and die. And we love to reference the cross, the cross changed everything. Yes, it did. Amen. Praise God. I'm so grateful for that. I'm not saying that there's not something to say about the cross. There is. There's just also something to say about everything else that Jesus did and everything else that Jesus said. It all culminates up into this moment of the cross, but it wasn't like all of a sudden out of nowhere Jesus like does this incredible act of selfless love. His life's journey revealed that and, and exemplified that in so many ways. Jesus lived among people in a specific time and place in history as God incarnate, and he modeled the character of God in the flesh amidst relationships, politics, religious groups, socioeconomic, racial, and gender tensions. Jesus lived amidst that. And while we love to talk about Jesus' incredible act of love demonstrated on the cross and boldly proclaim our belief in that, even if the world calls us crazy, we are less inclined to retweet Jesus' most controversial and offensive teachings and actions. And there are so many examples. There are so many examples in Scripture. Jesus was saying and doing so many controversial things that people, religious leaders, literally devised a plan to have him murdered. That's what happened. Jesus did not come to the religious leaders to negotiate a deal. He's like, hey, guys, I'm here to die for the sins of the world. So if you could, like, stir up this little thing, murder me, I'll do my thing because, like, that's the plan. And then don't worry, I'll forgive you later. You can repent. In fact, I'll even forgive you when I'm up on the cross. It's going to be great, okay? So just do that. That is not what Jesus did. He did not come down and negotiate a, a deal with the religious leaders. The religious leaders were not just taking one for the team. They're like, well, somebody's got to kill him if the world's going to be saved. Like, it should be us. We're the religious leaders. No. Jesus was so offensive to the religious leaders that, that they saw him as a heretic. They saw Jesus as the problem. They were so convinced that they were right, they killed him. Have you not seen this? Have you not seen religious groups and believers be so convinced that they're right about something? Oh, I don't know, maybe slavery and be wrong about it, right? Christians have got it wrong for centuries. 
It's the religious leaders who killed Jesus. And it's because Jesus lived in a way that offended them, that was countercultural, that upset the status quo. He touched the leprous. He healed on the Sabbath. He allowed women to sit at his feet and learn. He called the inadequate to be his disciples. He singled out the marginalized and the oppressed. He made crazy commands about giving all your possessions to the poor, being born again, extending forgiveness again and again and again. He even said that the weak, the poor, the mourning, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, those were the ones that were blessed. Oh, and Jesus just could not stop exclaiming over and over and over that despite those deep-rooted Jewish Israelite beliefs, traditions, and experiences of the past, Gentiles' lives actually did matter to Jesus, and they would become children of God. We miss the offensive realities of what Jesus did because we don't take the time and the energy to make that make sense today. What would that have looked like today? So I want us to hone in on one teaching just briefly as we get ready to close. One uh, teaching in particular of Jesus to invite us into deeper thought and consideration about whether or not we would actually follow Jesus today. I know we all want to trust in Jesus because who doesn't want heaven, right? I mean, sure. Who, want, who doesn't want peace that surpasses understanding? But do we want to follow Jesus? They're different verbs. What would we have thought of Jesus today? If Jesus came out boldly saying something like he did in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, he said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. That's a a command from Leviticus. And hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? I love that Jesus chooses the people groups that they would feel most haughty about, right? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Don't get lost in that. Like, obviously, we can't be perfect. There's something unpacked there, but we're not going to pack it today because we don't have time. Okay? (laughs) Because we're not talking about that. What does the world today think of the kind of ideology that Jesus is spitting right there? Love your enemy? What a load of crap. What are we, hippies? Peace, peace, peace. Or that's bull crap because, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk like that. That is, I'm sorry. That is terrible because what about justice? We should seek justice. And if we just love our enemies, they'll just run all over us. Right? If I just love my enemy, they get all the power. Right? Doesn't it feel that way? If someone's persecuting you and Jesus is like, hey, love your enemy, you're like, excuse me? So who's going to set them right? I don't know how it works because the kingdom of God is mysterious and strange, and we have to figure out what that looks like in each specific situation. But somehow, like MLK said, only love can drive out hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So somehow, somehow, the foolishness of God, and don't act like it doesn't sound a little foolish, because it does, because we're human and we are indoctrinated into these ways of thinking in the world that says, like, we should do what's logical and make sense and will help us survive. And get what we want. And we should defend against anybody that that has other things going on. Right? Matthew 5, 17, Jesus reminded them, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to abolish them. He came to fulfill them, not to abolish them. And he actually makes them more expansive. Now, nowhere in Scripture does it say hate. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it command people to hate their enemy. There's some pretty intense stuff about foes in the Old Testament. Again, seek it, unpack it. We could never unpack that today. But I think you should look into it. It's confusing. So the point is, never in the Old Testament are people commanded to hate their enemy. Jesus makes that comment because he's highlighting the way people are interpreting, right? Love my neighbor. Sure. Okay. Then I can hate my enemy because my enemy is my enemy. And that's just obvious, right? Why would you have affectionate feelings for your enemy, or why would you care for your enemy? Why would you care what happens to them? But why does Jesus say we should love our enemy? There's a big so that in verse 45. He says, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that loving our enemies is the means by which we are received as children of God. We know that's not true. The only way to become children of God is through the Savior, Jesus Christ. 
but perhaps, and if you look into this Greek verb a little bit, you'll find that it's possible to interpret it in a way that's more about becoming, growing into our identification as children of God, becoming more like Jesus. And if we are saturated in the love of God, and we walk in that, and we know it, and we seek it out, we will naturally become so consumed with spreading that love, with making spreading that love a priority. It will change the way we respond to the world. Because, you know, also in Matthew, Jesus says, like, you've heard, do not kill, right? Well, I say, don't even, like, harbor anger in your heart against your brother and sister. It's pretty intense. So I want to leave us with some questions today. (laughs) Because loving our enemies in these divisive times should not be elementary Christianity. It is the foundation. And if we were so good at understanding love your enemy, we'd be a heck of a lot better at loving our neighbor. Right? Because we aren't always very good at that either. These are the questions I want to leave you with. What if you started reading the Gospels, specifically looking for practical ways that Jesus modeled the wisdom of God in the world? What if you started making a list of things that Jesus taught or did that feel offensive to you? Or what if you took all the ways that other people interpret scripture that you find offensive and you started investigating it on your own on the very off chance that you could be wrong about something? Or what if you searched the scriptures for things Jesus said and did and worked hard to come up with cultural equivalents? That actually takes a lot of energy. It takes investigating and effort to discern what would that cultural equivalent be today? Consider your leader allegiances and ask yourself if you are walking in the ways of Jesus in how you speak, tweet, advertise your ideas and beliefs, and in how you treat or speak to people who disagree with you. Could you classify your heart and your actions and your words as loving your enemy? And if Jesus shared his teachings, ideas, and lifestyle on a daily basis today in 280 characters or less, how many times would you actually like his tweets? Or would you find his content so offensive that you'd just unfollow him? If God's wisdom is foolishness in the world, we need to rethink what we call foolish. This matters, right? It matters that the labels we use to identify ourselves and the leaders we pledge our support to have become the things that divide us most. What if there's another way? I bless you in the name of Jesus. You are dismissed.